Hi, everyone, and welcome to Right in Front of My Face, the podcast talking about big things happening right in front of us. I'm your host, Shannon Hall, and welcome to episode 14. You may not have recognized this podcast from the intro because we have an incredible new piece of music for the introduction. Thank you, thank you to Ronan O'Mahony for permissions to use this incredible piece of music. I'm so excited. I'm fangirled, and I'm really, really proud. So thank you. Now, on to episode 14. I'm continuing down the path of finding guests who are relevant to our world at this moment in a pandemic. I have two kids at home, a pre k and a second grader, and we are navigating this new world of internet-based learning. My kids attend a Catholic school in Seattle, and on the first day of digital learning, it became very clear to me why the Seattle Public School District was in a complete quandary about how to manage equality among its students. I talk about that in the interview. Because I have no personal visibility into the public school system, I wanted to bring in a guest to discuss the disparities in the Seattle Catholic school system. I think as a nation, we're at a point where public versus private doesn't matter anymore. This huge academic gap that's being created will be felt most by the poor, period. Enter Larkin Teme. Larkin is the principal of Holy Family Bilingual School in White Center, just 10 miles south of Seattle. We're separated by a short stretch of I-5, but a long stretch of socioeconomic circumstances. The students at Holy Family are diverse, they're bilingual, and from backgrounds very different than the kids in Northeast Seattle. I wanted to hear from her about how she's pivoted her community to digital learning, how that was possible knowing that so many families don't have basic internet access, and whether or not she's concerned about this achievement gap created by internet-based learning. Spoiler alert, she is. So, Larkin, you are the principal at Holy Family Bilingual School. Yes. In is it West? Is it White Center officially or West Seattle? Um, well, it's it's in the city of Seattle, but it's in White Center. You okay. know, it's it's about a block from White Center, but just how the way the way the Seattle boundary goes, it literally goes right around our school and yeah. church. I would like to start with you, kind of talking about yourself. Tell us where you came from, what your education was about, and kind of how you ended up at Holy Family. So I was born here in Seattle, but then moved to Northern California. Well, I guess kind of Bay Area, California, um, when I was four. My parents are both from the Bay Area, and so they had graduated from UW, and they wanted to move back home. They uh, built a, a house in a rural area in, called Watsonville, and so I went to an elementary school called Aromas Elementary School. And Were your parents educators also? They were not. Okay. No, my, my mom's a landscape architect, and my dad is in sales. Oh, and wow. so he actually went into business with his brother selling playground equipment in the area, and uh, my mom kind of worked from our basement. But uh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. And so um, so I went to Aromas Elementary School. And at the time I started kindergarten and it was a half day kindergarten. And my parents literally have a picture and there's probably, you know, 25 kind of niños de los campesinos, predominantly Mexican first generation immigrants um, working who are working in the strawberry fields. Um, and yeah. so that was my experience of kindergarten through fourth grade. And were you all were you bilingual at home also? So my parents both speak Spanish as a second language. OK, so it's not in my heritage or, you know, I think we have some Spanish in our lineage and our family lineage, but we, I certainly didn't grow up in a bilingual household, but I did grow up in a, what was by default a bilingual school. It was a public school. Um, and at the time, California was an English only state. So okay. it was required, you know, that you, you taught in English. Um, and this is how everybody was going to learn English, regardless of where they came from. So, you know, that, experience at Aromas Elementary had a really huge impact on me. Yeah, you were really little. Yeah, I was really little. And I learned Spanish just by being around people who spoke Spanish. And while it wasn't a bilingual school by, by, you know, it wasn't supposed to be a bilingual school, it kind of defaulted to a bilingual program where directions were in English and in Spanish. And so I learned Spanish just by, by hearing it, you know, really wanting to be around this community. You know, a lot yeah. of um, kind of the decisions I made in my career path and the things that I like to do have been influenced by the Hispanic community, um, you know, that I was, that I kind of grew up in. 
moving forward, I went to Santa Clara University, yep. go, Broncos, go Broncos, and I studied psychology and Spanish. And I had some really influential professors who kind of encouraged me to go a little bit deeper on things that I was passionate about, such as bilingual education. Um, and so I did kind of some social justice um, projects. I was really involved in social justice. I was a SCAP, Santa Clara Community Action Program. I do remember that. Yeah. So I worked really closely with that group of people. And I worked, I remember working at a Head Start preschool. It was like learning on the field. I forget what they called it then, but, um, you know, it's like part of your credit is to go out and do community service. Yeah. Well, I was in the business school at Santa Clara, so I didn't, I don't think we had to do community service as a part of the business school. It's a little embarrassing to hear you talk about that because I'm like, I really needed to do more. Well, I think they, I feel like they <laughs> really, education. I think it was I think it was some of the professors I had too. Yeah. You know that were saying, you know, you're you're a Spanish and psychology major. Yeah. Go out and learn Spanish in the community. And so Well, it's a liberal arts school too. Yeah. So that's really that's really where Santa Clara shines. And, and and the influence of the Jesuits. Absolutely. As well. So, you know, I worked at day worker centers teaching English as a second language. At the time, it was called ESL. Mm -hmm. And then I worked um, also at a kind of a Head Start preschool. And I remember driving back from volunteering at a Head Start preschool and, the, and being like, I can't believe they're not letting these kids speak Spanish, their heritage language. These kids should be learning in their heritage language. Yeah. And I said to my friend, and she remembers this, and she was in the business school, so she did do some <laughs> service. <laughs> Uh, I said to her, and she remembers it, I said, when I'm older, I'm going to start my own bilingual school, you know, and I'm going to, wow. and we're going to be learning in English and in Spanish. But you were a psychology major. Did you want to teach? Was that always going to be your kind mm -hmm. of end goal? I didn't know what I wanted to do. Oh, um, shocking. <laughs> I shocking. really, I kind of wanted to do a little bit of everything. Yep. Um, That's a liberal arts. I was just was, saying this yeah. yesterday. We're minorly interested in yeah. a lot of things and yeah. not majorly interested in much. And I, and I got really like hyper-focused on a certain thing I'd want to do and then something else and this and that. Yep. I mean, I think I started as a, as a biology major and then realized that I'm too social of a person to spend <laughs> hours in the lab. Yeah. And so that's where I got really involved in all of this community service and going out in the, com in the, in the community and um, making really good connections. So um, I decided to become a teacher. I liked teaching and I didn't have another career path. So I went and did a program and I wanted to go somewhere that I had never been before. Okay. So I went to the East Coast. I, re I realized I had been to more countries than I had states because um, I'd studied abroad in South America, you know, and I was able yeah. to travel um, you know, Where kind were of you in South America? I was in Chile, okay. in Santiago de Chile. So I spent my whole junior year at the Jesuit University in Santiago. Okay. I was in Madrid. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That was another one of the choices. Being bilingual, I was able to kind of directly enroll in one of the other Jesuit universities and take yep. classes. And so, so that was, that was a wonderful experience as well. And I met a lot of other, um, I met a lot of Chileans and I met people from Australia and I met friends and we were able to backpack around South America, which was wonderful. So lucky that we... Got to have those experiences. I, I can't even imagine. Okay, so you study abroad, you graduate. Decided like, to become a Spanish teacher. Going to be a Spanish and see, teacher. see what the East Coast was all about. Okay. And I was a Spanish teacher in a place called Fall River, Massachusetts. Okay. Which is predominantly Portuguese, Azorian Portuguese. Very interesting experience. Um, and then I lived in Boston and worked at a charter school for one year. It wasn't a Catholic. It was my first experience not being in Catholic school since fifth grade. And it was a wonderfully, it was a wonderful, diverse community, predominantly people from Haiti. Okay. And I really loved it. And I loved living in Boston, but wanted to be here in Seattle. So Were your parents back in Seattle at that they point? They were back in Seattle. Yeah. Okay. They'd stay, we moved here in fifth grade and they had stayed kind of in Seattle. Okay. And then, you know, came back and, oh, well, I wanted to work at Holy Names. That's where I graduated from high school okay. and they didn't have a Spanish teacher position open. So I figured I'll go work at O'Day. So I worked at O'Day high school for all girls nine to years. All boys. Yeah. I said, it's, so this is close enough. And when something comes up at Holy Names, then I'll go there. And it was great. It was a really good learning experience, but you know, I still had this kind of deep pull for language learn bilingual education and wanting yeah. to, you know, to really do some work in bilingual education and, and feeling like this is the way that languages should be learned. This is a way that we can help close an achievement gap for a really wonderful community. And there's just, it can be just so much d deeper yeah. of a learning experience when you're bilingual. And so, um, at the time, you know, then I had my daughter and she went to Holy Family. And I remember looking at schools and I love Catholic schools because of the community. Yep. And so when I found Holy Family and I met the kindergarten teacher, I said, there's really no other place that I would like to have my daughter. This is, this will be her teacher. So she went to Holy Family. And so um, she was at Holy Family for um, kindergarten and first grade. And then the principal of Holy Family suddenly passed away. And I was on a, a board for a principal search committee and then 
I remember I was kind of disinvited to one of the principal search committee meetings. And then the next, they kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, we think you should apply for this job. I said, wow, I, so I, I can't be a principal. So at that point, you had no experience in administration. I had some at O'Day. Um, you know, I worked as a program director at O'Day, but it wasn't, you know, there were, there was a lot of planning and it was some experience, but I did not have um, experience as a principal. I didn't have any education. Wow. So that, I mean, that is unbelievable that you're a part of the search committee. And then they're like, actually, why don't you not come to this meeting? Mm -hmm. And they're like, we're, I mean, to have that backing right off seems incredible. The, The interim principal at the time, and I, she, she and I are still really good friends. Her name's Chris Brown and she's my motivation. I want to be just like her, but she was the interim principal at the time I had come out of retirement. And I remember a meeting with her and I said, all right, so I'm ready to do the video for the auction. I was going to have my AP Spanish class, make the video for the Holy family auction. She goes, I don't care about the video for the auction. I, (laughs) I said, but I have some, I have a plan. And she said, I don't care about that. What I care about is you applying for this principal job. Tell me a little bit more about Holy Family, because I didn't say in the intro that it is a bilingual school. Mm -hmm. Is it the only one? And there are 73 schools in the Seattle Archdiocese. So that was actually more than I realized. Is it the only bilingual school? Is it Well, there are two, but the other bilingual school is is doing a little bit of a program change. So at this point, it is the only dual language program school. Wow. Okay. So what was the enrollment when you decided to apply for the job? It was just over a hundred. Okay. It was, you know, I think there were about 115 students at that point enrolled. K through um, eight. K through eight, preschool through eight. So very small classes. A few combined, you know, there was, there was a combined class and, you know, the school wasn't doing that well. And I think that's because, you know, the dual language program, it, it has to be done well. And it was, it wasn't that it wasn't done well. It just, there was some, it was a little slow to start. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's what we've been really working on is kind of streamlining the dual language program at Holy Family. But you know it's a, it's it is a wonderfully diverse community, diverse racially, diverse socioeconomically. And what I love about the school is that it's a true reflection of the White Center area. Yeah, our school is predominantly Latino Hispanic, and with the dual language program, the the school has grown from about I think it was you know maybe forty percent Latino Hispanic when I started, and now we're at sixty seven percent Latino Hispanic. So you land the job and you're like, awesome. Now what do I do? They're like, here's your office. (laughs) Pretty much. And I was like, I didn't even want to be a principal, (laughs) but here we go. Yeah. And and I really did feel called. I felt like this is, I've always wanted to do this. This is, this is my dream. And so I. That's what I was going to, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, I feel like when things like this happen, it is something that you just feel a deep, deep passion for. Yeah. And. And, you know, to be honest, if somebody had said, what do you want to be, you know, do you always want to be a Spanish teacher? I would have said, you know, eventually I want to be a university professor. I still have that dream to be a university professor, but this is what I wanted to do. You know, I never, I never really wanted to be a principal, but I always really believed in bilingual education. And this is just kind of how the path is unfolding. And so, you know, so I do, I go in the office and I said, all right, well, let's look at enrollment. What's our enrollment? And the office of admin, it said, how, who do, how many people do we have enrolled so far? And it was July 1st and we had 90 students enrolled. And I was like, oh my goodness. Wow. We've, we've, how are we paying teachers right now? Yeah. And it was, um, I couldn't, I couldn't get my hands on the budget. I, I, you know, it was, it was pretty challenging at first and I didn't have any experience. I didn't have any training, but you're a hustler. You're, you can be a hustler when it's something you believe in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, can, I can be a hustler, you know. Or but just driven with sheer passion. Yeah. And it was that, I mean, this school is, it's a very, very special place. I think all Catholic schools are really special places because they have these wonderful communities. That's my favorite part about Catholic schools is, is the community and all the parents helping and the values and everybody yeah. kind of connected, even if they're not Catholic. But this school is special in that it's a unique Catholic school because our population is um, different from most Seattle area Catholic schools demographically. Which is another reason why... I wanted to have this conversation with you because I live in a pocket of Seattle that is very different from your school's population. And I think it is easy to forget in this city that 10 miles south of I-5, there are Catholic schools who are, you know, all teaching the same values, similar curriculums, all of that, but have very, very different neighborhoods 
from which they are pulling students from. Mm-hmm. And as you know, my neighborhood that I have lived in for 20 years and didn't realize at the time is pretty affluent, not a ton of diversity here, but, you know, getting the technology up and running. I mean, our school was able to pivot in one week. I mean, it was truly a gift and unbelievable to watch. Talk to me a little bit about your school's population. Yeah. So, so like I said, I mean, we do have, we have close to 40% of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch. It's, so it is a lower income population. Our tuition without financial aid is about $5,000 for one student in parish. Okay. And, and we really can't raise it too much because of the the community. Right. You know, we, and we I don't want to, I want to clarify and say in parish tuition for those people out there that don't know with Catholic schools, if you belong to the parish that the school is affiliated with, you generally get a tuition break. Mm-hmm. So that's what, that's what that in parish tuition mm-hmm. means. It usually costs more if you are not attending or affiliated with the parish of the neighborhood school. Mm-hmm. So I just want to yeah. clarify that. Yeah. Like I said, it is diverse socioeconomically, um, racially. And, and we think that's our strongest asset and that this diversity is what prepares students, you know, for, for the world, I think. But that being said, a lot of our families are, um, you know, the parents are first generation immigrants. So you start off with 90 students enrolled preschool mm-hmm. through eight, what, take me through the next few years. What happens? How do you build on enrollment? What kind of happens for you in this, in this school? So I, I mentioned the interim principal who basically kind of nudged me really hard, more like elbowed me, you know, or, you know, and yeah. said, you're going to take, you yeah. should take this job. You're doing this. But she really kind of put us with the archdiocese. So the archdiocese kind of realized the school needs some help and the school is going to have a brand new leader. And so they kind of rallied behind Holy Family and so did Fulcrum. um, And we were able to get some grants and try to really straighten things out. What we did first is we made some changes to our dual language program because we said, you know, here's the promise that we're we're promising parents that they're going to be bilingual, biliterate. Well, let's reconstruct our program so that it, you know, models And so that that is the promise is that when kids graduate from Holy Family, they're bilingual, biliterate. Um, with an increased level of sociocultural competence. And those are- Interesting, okay. Yeah, these are and with academic excellence. So, okay. you know, the idea behind a dual language program, and our school is a two-way immersion model, okay. which is really beautiful because what it is is that everybody at Holy Family is a language learner. Everybody is learning English or they're learning Spanish. And pretty, pretty quickly, they all become emerging bilinguals. That is so, um, cool. so students are teaching each other. Yeah. Teachers are teaching students. And it's, it's really, it's really wonderful because there is no us versus them. Yeah. It's everybody is a language learner and everybody has really wonderful gifts that they bring to the classroom linguistically. And we leverage those gifts, you know, for our heritage speakers, which is really cool. And it's, it's a, it's a, it creates a sense of community and that it, um, what needs to happen is having classroom communities. So, you know, rather than having it's all the job of the teacher to teach the students, it's the job of the teacher to create a classroom community where everybody brings their strengths and right. everybody works together to grow kind of collectively. So over the course of four years, how much are you able to grow enrollment? So we have 171 students now, which is great. Yeah. And we were projecting to have between 180 and 185 in the fall. And then COVID hit. So, you know, that what, what's really hard is that the school is on such a positive trajectory. Yeah. You know, we were getting a lot more students. We're, we're at waitlist situations with some of our classes. Um, we received a grant from Shea Homes Charities to remodel our school. Pretty sizable grant. That's awesome. Which is just, you know, this is like the tipping point for our school. And, you know, we're going and the motivation is there and everybody's really excited and holy family's coming out of the dark times. And then COVID hits. Boom. And it, and it hit us hard. I think it hit every school hard. I, I I can't say that it hit us harder than any school. I can't say that it hits private schools harder than public schools. I, you know, I can't say that it hit Holy Family more than Assumption, but, but it hit us hard. Talk to me about that. We have a lot of families that don't know how to check email. I mean, and we have a lot of families who do, and we have a lot of families who don't have internet. And so, kind of the way it happened is, is I had a feeling that this was some districts had closed, things were happening. And I had a feeling that something was going to happen. And then 
from one day to the next, we get the announcement in the middle of the school day. Yeah. Seattle Public Schools is closing. This is our last day. They're going to be closed. It was March 12th yep. or, or March 11th and March, starting March 12th, Seattle Public is, is closed. So we're waiting for something from the archdiocese because it is good to kind of make these, some of these big decisions, you know, in, in alignment with what the archdiocese says. And yep. so we kind of waited for that, which is, but I still made um, kind of a second plan. I said, we're going to have school on March 12th. And the entire day is going to be commitment to equity and training our students because a lot of them are going to need to do this on their own. We're going to do mock Google Hangouts. And so we did go to school on the 12th, which was the next day. And I think our school did too. And we had, I think that was a, that was a Wednesday. So we had a faculty meeting that Wednesday, the the 11th. Mm -hmm. And then I said, we're going to come in and I, we, I called the teachers and I said, you know, I, Seattle public schools is closed and um, we are going to have school tomorrow. And I told all the families we're going to have school tomorrow. Uh, If you don't feel comfortable having your children go to school, it's an an excused absence, but we are going to have school tomorrow. And then the teachers, you know, that whatever the agenda was for the meeting was just gone gone and I don't think it's even come back yet we, we've been like I've been like remember we're working on biliteracy and the teachers are like don't even bring anything new right now <laughs> do you I'm want just teachers surviving. next year <laughs> I'm just surviving right um and so we had a meeting and I and I wrote on the board I wrote equity and I said everything we do tomorrow in school is about equity um we at Holy Family need to make sure that these children have access to learning I don't know when we're going to be back at that point it was two weeks but I said it could potentially yeah. be longer. And so here's what your classes need to look like tomorrow. And let's all talk about what, what that can look like and what equity means. And so, um, you know, we talked about taking away barriers for students, you know, language barriers, um, internet access barriers, and things that we can do while we have one day with these students in our control to get them ready to be at home and learning at home, you know, and we know that Holy Family is a small community. We know our families. We know our students, our teachers know that this family is not going to be able to instantly log on to Google Classroom. But what we can do in the meantime, time while we're helping them is we can print out a packet yeah. and we can label that. And so we, I had the teachers there that Wednesday and Thursday. So Thursday, that Wednesday, a lot of teachers stayed late, you know, super committed staff and started work on this. And then Thursday we worked with the students. We, um, I had the student council set up a table, a technology distribution and, and training table, and they helped some parents to get online. They, they taught parents how to toggle their hotspots to the computer while they're waiting to get internet. And then we printed off some free resources in English and Spanish of things they could call to get internet. And then all Um, all of this is happening in one day. On Thursday. Yeah. That was Thursday, the first day that Seattle Public was closed. What percentage of your families would you say don't have access to internet? I think it was probably about a quarter of our families at that time, but it was hard to say because we didn't know. And a lot of them use, just use their phones. They don't have a computer at home. They use their phones. I think that is the one thing for me that has been the biggest wake up call. And it's just like, again, i I I recognize the place of privilege that I am in when I say it is, it doesn't always occur to me that there are people with literally no internet because it is just a utility Mm -hmm. it's available and, and we have it. And so I think when you really dig down into that equity issue that you're talking about, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what school you're going to, even within an archdiocese within the Seattle public school system, there are so many families without this basic, basic resource. And, and just right there, that's, there's, there's the achievement gap a lot of times, especially with COVID. You've got families who don't have internet and families who do. And I, I commend the public schools for saying, we need to take a pause and make sure we're doing this correctly. Yeah. I, I commend them because that's doing it right. Yeah. They don't have 171 students. You know, they, they have, you know, they have yeah. a whole district and I cannot imagine being a public school district administrator and trying to make a plan. I mean, it's really hard, but no. And I, it's funny cause I feel like I had judgment about it when mm-hmm. it, you know, you look at the news and you're mm-hmm. looking at what the Seattle times is putting out and you're like equity, like how is this that big of an issue? And then literally, like I said, that first day home, I was like, oh yes, there's absolutely no way that this could happen. Like there are not a lot of families that can just go to office depot and spend $200 on toner and have a working printer and have paper and have all the things that you need to have. And you look at what kids are going to suffer and what kids aren't. And it was 
it was blatantly clear on the first day. And, and, you know, I think even with, with any school, public and private, we're seeing that there are students who are moving forward and learning. And there are students who have parents that can work from home. And then we have students, for example, that are watching their siblings. Yeah. I've, I've got a fifth grader who's watching her three-year-old sister because her parents have to work. Their kid, they can't stay home. Yeah, there's um, no option. And so she's supposed to be logging into the computer and working and then also watching her three-year-old sister. I've got another seventh grader who watches two twins, two twin kindergartners, you know, and then we also have, you know, We've got families who are having a hard time putting food on the table because they're two income families and both mom and dad have lost their jobs. We have families who are undocumented and sure. don't qualify for a stimulus check and are not able to receive any benefits of unemployment. And I've talked to these families, you know, we've we've really tried to make it a point to focus on the well-being of our students and then also the well-being of our families. We have teachers doing weekly check-ins on the phone. And then I've called, um, I've called every family, but some more than others, just to make sure that they're okay and that the students are okay. But when you're having a hard time even putting food on the table or figuring out how you're going to pay rent, computer toner, you know, yeah. and, and that's the, Google that's Classroom the is, thing you're is about. just not, yeah. And, and this is not all of our families, but this is a good number of families in the Seattle area. Absolutely. I think um, it's more than anyone realizes. Yep. So I was trying to do a little bit of prep for this interview. And I just, I read an article by a, a man named Richard Rothstein. He's a scholar and a fellow, and he put out an article about the academic gap dealing with COVID. And his point, which is so blatantly obvious, but I had never really considered before, is that, you know, neighborhood schools are still completely segregated by what area they are in. Mm -hmm. And the parents that can stay at home in certain neighborhoods have graduated from college, have you know, even higher education than that. And so you have, you know, a biologist who's now staying at home, taking their children out on nature walks mm -hmm. and, you know, teaching them about how spores and how, you know, how the forest works and how the ecosystems are. I experienced this because I got an email from one of our neighbors. She's a scientist at NOAA. Mm -hmm. And she was like, hey, I don't know if any of you have kids at home that are interested in science, but I'm giving this talk on phytoplankton. Here's the email address. Well, it's gotten my son completely hooked on these marine biology webinars. He watches three of them a week. That's awesome. But again, it's my own kind of blinder and privilege where you're like, wow, this is the gap right here because the learning that's happening is still learning right? They're still getting stimulated. They're still getting opportunities that other kids don't get by pure virtue on where we live in the city. And, and the opportunities that, that their parents have had. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I recognize that I have that as well. And, you know, we, my family has a lot of, a lot of privilege as well. You know, I can, I am able to stay home with the children. I mean, oftentimes I'm on zoom webinars all day and I come back and they've like scotch taped their whole faces <laughs> or they've like found the funniest words ever to put on Google translate. And I come out of this meeting and it's like the Google translate is saying the funniest thing and the kids are rolling on the ground laughing, you know, but I know how to, I know the system I, I've created, we've created the system. We created Google classroom and we do this and I know exactly what teachers are expected to do. And so I'm very fortunate that I know how to get my kids online and how to do that. And it's easy for me. Right. And we've got parents and even I've has I have some teachers who, you know, didn't know what Google drive was before this and have had to, yeah. you know, and so I've had lots of many, many hours of phone calls with teachers and with parents and our office administrator, who's phenomenal, rolled up her sleeves and is on the phone with parents and is video FaceTiming parents and like showing them how to click. And, you know, you gotta, here's the code for the Google Classroom. Okay, now you go do this. And then like just step by step. Wait, I still don't get it. Okay, well, how, here's how you do it again. And the teachers were doing that. I mean, we were like- And, and I'm sure the kids are actually helping at this point too. Yeah. So when you and I talked initially, I had said, you know, I am not super concerned about my own kids- academic gap. My kids are young. My son's going into third grade. My daughter's in kindergarten. My son is like a voracious learner. He is like consuming these webinars and these opportunities that we're finding for him, 
you know, on out school, he's starting a video game design course, you know, and he, so he's consuming other things, Mm -hmm. but I'm not worried about them. Are you genuinely concerned about the gap that's going to happen for your student population whenever these closures end? Absolutely. Talk to me about that. I am absolutely concerned about that. And that's what the teachers and I are talking about right now. Even with all of our efforts and trying the best that we can to, you know, face this distance learning with equity, it's not the same equity that you can provide in a classroom. We still have students who have not signed on. We have students where we're deeply concerned about their, um, we've had, I've had teachers drive by students' houses and just knock on the door and then go away and say, I'm just checking that you're okay. That we are going to see a lot of, uh, differences in the fall or or whenever we can go back. And as much as we have tried and really rolled up our sleeves, we are going to see some students that are even farther behind. And the ones that are farther behind are the ones that were already behind just because they don't have access. the, the, The education system, perhaps even in the United States, is not one that their parents are familiar with. So they're, they're, you know, they've grown up in a different, in a different area where education is different. It's not just a matter of we put things online and they're just not doing it. It's, right. it's understanding the system and having the support and, you know, being able to stay home and save lives and stay safe. That, that's, that's a privilege. It um, is a privilege. That, that a lot of our parents don't have. It's, it's so funny that you say that because I have found myself starting to get really frustrated by the amount of judgment people have about who's staying home and who's not. Because I feel like it is very, very easy to get critical when you have the ability to stay at home and collect your Facebook, your Google, your Amazon paycheck, and you have the privilege to work from home when so many cannot. And that's that's frontline workers that's Mm -hmm. you know essential workers that's it's just such an easy thing to say like we should all stay home but people can't and and a lot of these people who can't stay home are are you know families that live with another family you know we've got some of those families at our school you know so they are living with their aunt they're you know kind of like two sisters that live together with their families and um one is an essential worker and has to go out and work you know they're you know, cleaning hospital cleaners have to clean the hospital. So they're exposed. And so they bring families in and it's, and it's really hard. And it's, I don't think anyone is judging people who are, you know, essential workers and having to go work, but, but it is really hard for all of this stay home, stay, save lives, you know? And, and I think that if people are able to, and are in a situation to, then they should, but it, it is important to understand that it is not an option for some families. I think the other thing that you had said that kind of stuck with me also about this gap, because I do have an incoming kindergartner, was when you said, you know, some of our kids coming in have actually not been to preschool before. So our incoming kindergartners haven't had exposure to the alphabet, to their letters, to Mm -hmm. all of that stuff, which again is something I completely take for granted because my daughter has had preschool education. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a it's a really important point to think about in this whole conversation about equity, which again extends from public school to Catholic school to private school, to charter school. It doesn't matter what school your kid is going to, because in every population, there are going to be these kids. How long did you tell me it takes to make up that gap? It, it takes, it takes years. I, I think that it, you know, well, and you know, when I was talking about the dual language program, it's six to seven years, um, in a dual language program for like a L1 Spanish, if their first language is Spanish, um, it takes about seven years for them to be grade level in a dual language program. So if you are talking about, uh, at, at least that's what the research An immigrant says. family, a five-year-old coming in that does not speak English, it will take them seven years to just catch up. To be at grade level. Mm-hmm. When they're in a dual language program, you know, and I could talk about dual language program research all day because it's one of my hobbies, but that says that dual language programs can help to close that achievement gap better than uh, kind of transitional bilingual programs where they'll say, okay, we're going to have you go in this school. And then when you're ready, you can go into mainline school or kind of pull out ELL classes. And Mm -hmm. so dual language programs help to 
kind of close that achievement gap for, uh, you know, ELL students a lot faster, especially right. if it's, you know, they're like, um, you know, Spanish speaker, L1 Spanish, their first language is Spanish, but it still takes a long time. And and what what's interesting is speaking also kind of a little bit more about privilege is kids like, for example, my kids who come into a dual language program within that same six or seven years of being in a dual language program, they're higher than grade level. Sure. Academically. So it, it's, you know, what could just because of the gray matter and the matter in the brain or, or whatever happens, but you just you know, have smart kids, Larkin. Well, I mean, well, sometimes, <laughs> I mean, let's, you want to spend a day watching them. Uh, I think you'd be really impressed with my fifth grader. She's been like a, a rock star. And then there's my uh, seven-year-old who's been studying the squirrels outside. And it's important. Um, it's biology. You, know, I mean, You're a, you did biology. <laughs> he's having a little bit of, I did do biology. Yes. He's, yeah, he's having a little bit of a harder time, but, but it's true. I mean, we have students who come in to Holy Family in kindergarten, you know, and, and we see it at Holy Family. We've got students who come into kindergarten reading in both English and Spanish. And if they've started in our preschool and gone to our pre-K and have families who are supporting their academics, they're coming into kindergarten reading in two languages. You know, they can read a three letter word in, in English, they can read cat and they could read mama or yes. mapa in Spanish coming in to kindergarten. Then we have students that come in without any education at all. Maybe they've been with abuelita since they yeah. were young because their parents are working and they go with abuelita and they're saying, well, we would love preschool and pre-K, but we can't afford it right now. And so we're going to come in in kindergarten. And some of those students that we see are recognizing letters. And so you've got these students that are reading mi mama me ama, you know, in Spanish, mm -hmm. mi mama me ama, because they, it's the syllabic memorization mm -hmm. in Spanish. And then you've got some students that are like learning their letters. And so really at Holy Family, that's where the community of learners comes in. And that's what we try to encourage is, and we don't say, I'm sorry. Uh, well, we will say to some families that we would recommend a year of pre-K before kindergarten, right. just to help kind of close, not, it won't close the achievement gap, but it'll help the students with some of those foundational skills. So that they can be more successful. And then um, wham, you get closed down mm -hmm. and no one has that option. So Larkin, before we run out of time, what's the answer? Oh, <laughs> that's the question <laughs> right I, there. Because we're talking and I have you. You know, I don't have, I, I don't have an answer. And I've had a lot of conversations as, as I'm sure a lot of principals have with what are we going to do in the fall? Yeah. And I explained to my families that I just, I don't know enough information to make, I, I don't want to make a promise right now that I can't keep. And I don't, I don't have enough information to make a call, but for Holy Family, if I have any say in it, um, we will bring children back to the building because there is so much more control of their learning and help and support and resources. And, you know, I think that the world has changed so much with COVID and people are learning that they can work from home and that's going to be great for our environment and our commuting yeah. patterns. And I think that's going to be really good. I don't think that will ever happen in schools and I don't think it should because what's going to, I, in my opinion, if we continue to have distance learning, there are going to be more and more of these kids who can learn about phytoplankton and NOAA 100%. and learn these amazing skills. And then those who are in their, and this is a real family hanging out with their parents as they're cooking in their restaurant on an Absolutely. iPad. Absolutely. Or have their fifth grade sister watching them who mm -hmm. can't, you know, like mm -hmm. that is a real thing. I, mm -hmm. I am so thankful that you were willing to actually give an opinion about it because I can't see a way to ever make it equitable. And I, and I, and I want to give it to a lot of our families and to teachers. There has been a tremendous learning curve. And we've had some families that are like, I don't even check email, you know, that are now logging their children onto Google Classroom. It's amazing. And good. I mean, I've got, I've got teachers who are scheduling Google Meets and never thought they were going to have to do that. And the, the learning curve has been great. And so it is possible, but I do think if it is safe, you know, obviously that's the right. first priority. If it is safe to bring children back to the building and we're able to structurally put into place best practices, you know, with recommendations from the state and such, then we will bring children back to the building because that's, we're, we're concerned about our, a lot of our students. I kind of feel like I don't want educators making any decisions until like August 31st. <laughs> oh man, kinda, I know it's, <laughs> I kind of want everybody to wait as long as possible, you know, till we know the most, I think everything is changing so quickly. It's just impossible, right. but it does start, it's starting to me to feel like kids are really going to get hit hard mentally from the mental health alone. I mean, that's a whole other conversation, 
but Mm -hmm. I see my kids suffering. I see their personalities changing a little bit and it scares me. Mm -hmm. It scares me more than kind of any educational piece, but, but it is that gap when you look at people in poverty versus people that aren't, it is so I feel dumb for saying it's shocking because it's really not like there are a lot of people that have recognized this, but I don't know in my personal educational experience if it has ever been as highlighted as it is right now. Yeah, I I agree with you. And I I think that whereas there are a lot of blessings and there's a lot of technology skills being learned. I mean, my second grader is is able to upload and download documents. I mean, I couldn't do that as a second grader, uh, but no. um, I can barely do that right now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but we're, and so there, there's, there's going to be this surge, you know, like 20 years from the future now of these kind yeah. of, there's going to be a different skill set. Um, yep. But it doesn't take away from the importance of being able to provide appropriate resources to ensure equity in a classroom. It, it, there's just, there's no way that that can happen with COVID. And COVID, I, in my opinion, is perpetuating the achievement gap. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, for giving your opinions, and um, for being willing to kind of highlight this issue with me because it's, I, I think it's important. I don't think it matters what school your child attends. This is a real thing. And I think it's a, it's a wake-up call for sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're welcome. I'm more than happy to speak about it. And you know, this, I'm a member of this community, just like just like anybody else, you know, I'm a parent in the school. Yeah, I'm the principal of the school, but I'm also a parent there. And so, you know, this is this is my community. And um, these these families are my community. And I and I, and I believe very much in this community. And I want to do whatever I can to support our families and our students. Thank you so much, Larkin, for coming on and educating me and everybody else about this particular issue. If anyone is interested in Holy Family Bilingual School, links will be up in my show notes at www.writeinmyface.net. Please share this podcast. I rely on shares and word of mouth for this podcast to grow. Also, please rate and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. I promise that this matters very much. Follow me on Twitter at in front of my face, Instagram at right in front of my face, and email at info at right in front of my face.com. Please be kind to yourself. This is such a stressful time universally for every single person. Just please remember that you're not alone and that there is still a lot of life happening right in front of your face. <laughs>